Intel just released their quarterly report. The stock fell. Let's take a look at it. This is, of course, not financial advice, entertainment purposes only. And so this is the quarterly report. So let's just quickly go through their condensed statements of income. And so there's a billion dollars almost up uh, in terms of net revenue. I don't know, like $900 million, if you want to be a little bit closer to the number. Their cost of sales went down, though. So you're looking at pretty much a billion dollars in terms of gross margin when you compare this quarter to last year, which is pretty impressive. Now, in terms of their operating expenses, that's almost up $900 million. That's pretty substantial. And so that's wiping out their gross margin. Of course, if you look at the previous lines, you can see a good chunk of that is in research and development. So to me, that's a good sign. Uh, and it's one of the things that makes me excited. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And uh, nevertheless, so even though they are kind of evening out on terms of what they're making, but they had a $1.7 billion gain in their equity and investments. And um, so, you know, we're talking about $6.8 billion this quarter versus $5 billion. So even though they kind of spent a lot of their gross margin on research and development, they're still up and uh, they didn't have to pay as much taxes. You know, I assume this is kind of a one-time thing, so I wouldn't expect that too much, but it's a $700 million difference between this quarter and the last. And so they're up 50% when you look at earnings per share. So that's pretty impressive to grow a billion dollars of gross margin, still spend a good chunk, if not all of it, and still be up 50% in earnings per share. It's amazing to me that this stock dropped, but we'll talk about that a little bit later about why people are surmising that. Now, if we look at the nine months ending, you can kind of see their gross margin stayed stagnant. They've clearly been putting this research and development in not just in the past three months, although $600 million, if you look at this, it's $11 billion uh, when you're looking at the nine months from September versus last year, it's $9.9 billion, so $10 billion. So you're talking about $1.1 billion, and yet in the last three months, they put in $600 million. Um, so, you know, as far as I would tell, that's like 50% in the past three months looks like they're ramping up what they're putting into research and development just from my perspective. So will this continue growing? I don't know. Uh, there's a part of me that thinks, yes, it might. Um, but I don't, like I said, I don't think that's a bad thing. I'm actually kind of excited about that. Now they do have this re restructuring and other charges. If someone knows about that. <laughs> Please leave it in the comments, but it's a pretty big substantial difference. 2.5 billion versus pretty much 146 million. I assume that's not a recurring thing. And uh, so you're going to have operating expenses up substantially when you're looking at the nine month version of this um, and operating income there, therefore will be down. Um, nevertheless, they kept their net income kind of on even keel, right? That has to do with their gains and losses of equity investment and all these other things. So it looks like they're kind of cognizant about how much money is coming into the company, how, how much money they can really spend into research and development and still have these, you know, statements of income, the balance sheet, everything kind of look like it's either stagnant or growing slightly, you know, they don't, they don't, it seems like they don't want to have a loss. Um, so I think that's, that's good business in terms of just understanding what your company can really put towards research, research and development. And there's a substantial amount that Intel has in terms of money. So when we're looking at the total current assets, and just try and remember this, it's going to be 61 billion versus um, previously it was 47 billion. And uh, in terms of cash, you know, cash, cash equivalents, you know, 9 billion versus 6 billion. So obviously increasing there, they're going to have a lot of money that they're going to be able to put towards, you know, their research and what, what they want to develop. Um, they have assets held for sale, which we're going to have to talk about. That's up about a billion dollars. And in terms of their short term investments, that's 22.7 billion versus 15.7 billion. I'll talk about that a little bit more, right? These are, I'm just highlighting the big number differences, which is kind of what you want to do when you're looking at these statements and try and get a better picture, more information about what's going on. And so I'm just kind of highlighting this because we're going to have to talk a little bit more about this in terms of goodwill and uh, intangible assets. So it's 33 billion here. Previously, it was 35 billion. So they're obviously not doing as well. Uh, they, you know, they're being written off, presumably, right? They're losing some of their value. But keep in mind, this is 33 billion compared to 170 billion. So it's a very small percentage of their balance sheet, which I think is really good. And obviously, they have a lot of intellectual property, a lot of things that I'm sure go into that, although they don't discuss it in the quarterly report. Now, in terms of their total current liabilities, right, it's 29.5 billion. Um, so that's going up considerably. That's an, uh, that's an increase of $5 billion, right? But nevertheless, when you consider their their debt in general on top of that. So another 35 billion. So you're talking about a huge amount of debt, right? You're talking about $65 billion of debt. But if you remember their total current assets was pretty much around that. So, you know, they could almost, if they could sell everything and get cash for everything they have in their total current assets, which in theory, they're supposed to be able to do that in 12 months. 
they could in theory pay off their debt. So even though this is a massive amount of debt, you know, their free cash flow, the money that they're getting in and the current assets they that they have, in theory, uh, it's very manageable debt. And so it doesn't actually alarm me, even though it is quite an alarming number, I suppose, right? Wouldn't that be nice to have such a large amount of debt and be able to say, oh, it's not a big deal, we could pay that off. Okay, but when we're looking at their statement of cash flows, just something that I thought popped out at me, especially since our previous videos, we talked about someone, and you can watch our previous videos if you'd like to, I think it was the last one. I don't think it was Tattooed Chef, I can't remember, but they had a very different problem here. So their accounts receivable Intel here is going up, and so obviously that's registered as income, so they're taking out that from the cash. They didn't actually get cash. That income is not recognized as cash. They're dis discounting it, right? That's how this works. They're paying money for the inventory, right? So they're clearly all these things are in line. They're getting more people buying, right? People owe them money in terms of accounts receivable. They're buying more. Their inventory is going up. Everything's kind of ramping up as far as I can tell. And so to me, that's a, that, that's a kind of a good sign, I think. And we'll have to see how everything plays out, right? It was only this quarter. But to me, that, like I said, that's a good sign. And uh, net cash provided by operating activities actually went down sub uh, a little bit. But like I said, $24 billion. If you can make $24 billion, you have $60 billion or $65 billion of debt. That's not so scary, right? In a few years, they could pay that all off if they wanted. I don't think they want to. Um, I think that they want to finance and develop and, and, and research and do all these amazing things. Like I said, pretty excited about that. But nevertheless, I'm not so concerned about the cash flow going down just because, of course, we have all of this uh, research and development we're talking about. And, of course, they're putting money into inventory, all these other things. So to me, it's not so surprising. Now, in terms of their purchase of trading assets, you can see it went up substantially. Probably with all the extra cash on hand, they have to make sure that they're hedging, you know, with different foreign, foreign currencies, things like that. Um, the maturities and sales of trading assets went up substantially. So right as they buy these things, they're going to mature eventually in future quarters, and it'll come back as cash, which they'll just have to, I suppose, reinvest either in themselves or in these hedging things, like I said. Now, in terms of their additions to property, plant, and equipment, right? So that's um, a pretty big amount, right? Uh, $1.2 billion. But, you know, like I said, I don't really mind these types of investments. And we'll, <laughs> I keep saying we're going to talk about it, we're going to talk about it. But uh, it's pretty exciting. I, it, it's pretty interesting. And if you're on board with what Intel's doing, it's exciting. And I think a really positive sign for the company. But these are the things you want to pick pick out, right? Pay attention. Why is all this money? Where is it going? Do I like what they're doing, right? This is what I'm trying to, I guess, uh, show just through example what you're doing when you're looking at these uh, quarterly reports. Okay, so the issuance of long-term debt and issu issuance of costs, right? There's a $5 billion difference um, in terms of their repayment and debt conversion, right? So previously, there was, I don't know, f roughly $5 billion being paid off. Now, not so much. Right. Previously, they were buying back $12 billion of common stock. Now, still 2.5, but not so much. And so when I look at that, I'm seeing, okay, so they're not necessarily um, going to be, let's say, as fiscally uh, careful with their money in terms of w w giving it back right now to the investor. And maybe that's part of why the stock went down, because they're seeing the company not repurchasing stock. They're seeing the company right? Not paying off the debt necessarily so quickly. <laughs> um, and that's because I think Intel is looking at their money and saying, no, we're not just going to give this back to the investor. We're actually going to invest it in our own systems in, our, in what we want to do. And uh, so like I said, if you're on board with that, this is exciting. If you're not on board with that, right? If you are a previous Intel shareholder, you might disagree and you might say, well, I'm not you know, if the company's not buying stock, I, I have less security in my head, right? It's becoming more of a growth company. Um, and so that might be a slight part of why some people are selling their stock because they don't want to be necessarily part of this. They don't want to take that risk of growth. Um, so that's interesting. And I haven't heard anyone say that, but when I'm looking at these numbers, it's something that kind of stuck out at me. Um, so in terms of the net increase in cash and cash equivalents, so even after, you know, all of these financing activities and everything, um, they didn't pay off nearly as much debt. They didn't use as much of their cash right? Previously, it was 11 billion. Now it's only 2 billion. And so at the end of the day, they have an increase in cash of 2 billion compared to previous, previous numbers. And so they're, um, they're up to 8 billion almost compared to, you know, 3.3 billion. So clearly, they have a lot more cash on hand. And I think they're looking at deploying that cash internally. That's kind of what I'm seeing. 
Now, in terms of their operating segments, there's quite a few. We'll go through them quickly. I'll be honest, I don't totally understand what's inside every single operating segment. And, uh, you know, as you invest in the company and watch it, you're going to be paying a lot more attention to a lot more of the details, I suppose. But when we're looking at CCG, generally that's looked at, uh, they call it client computing group. And, you know, when I hear that and when I did the research, that's just the general um, chips that they're selling to consumers, that consumers are going to be faced with, that type of thing. Uh, DCG is their data centric group. And so this is going to be in servers. Um, uh, probably you'll never buy one, but nevertheless, they're <laughs> a very big operating segment for Intel. So important to know about. And these are the two main operating segments. The other ones, they um, and we'll see in a second, they report just out of, I suppose, convenience or so you know what's going on. So IOTG, the Internet of Things, so as you find small devices, these chips might be very cheap. Nevertheless, they're just ubiquitous. They're everywhere. And so obviously very possibly a very profitable uh, part of Intel. And this was something that I saw developed a long time ago. Uh, Mobileye. Now, this is a pretty interesting Israeli company. We'll talk about this a lot more um, at the end. But self-driving cars, this is Intel. They're connected. They, you know, they bought this company. And um, I, I think there's a lot of interesting things for so many reasons. One, from the Intel side, but, you know, the, the business side, where this thing is going, is it really great? I think that there's a lot of lot to talk about there and we probably won't be able to talk about much of it, but it is worth mentioning and we'll talk about it later. NSG, their non-volatile memory storage group. Um, so if you don't know what this is, well, it doesn't really matter because they sold this segment. So don't worry about it, I suppose. Um, PSG, this is their programmable solutions group. So these are like FPGAs. It's a little hard to explain, but it's almost like you have hardware that you can program the hardware itself. As far as I remember, that's uh, how it works. Um, but nevertheless, uh, these are not so common. I don't, as far as I recall, in terms of, you know, consumer electronics, let's call it. So CCG and DCG, they're the reportable operating segments. They're just telling you the other ones because, you know, they think you should know them. In terms of their $18 billion of revenue for the quarter, pretty much you can look through this. You can see the client computing group, which is substantially the biggest, sadly was down 2% year over year which might be another reason that some people are selling because even though there was a lot of people from home and in theory buying computers, buying all these things, um, the fact that it was down in spite of that, maybe people are a little bit nervous about Intel's position in the market. But nonetheless, everything else was up year over year. And uh, you know, even though they're much smaller segments, they were still 5% year over year up. So you know, all these things are kind of balancing, I suppose. You know, It depends how you look at it. Now, when we're looking at the client computer group in terms of revenue, so you can see it was down just as, you know, $200 million when you're actually looking at the numbers for the three months ending in September. But when you look at the nine months ending, you can see it actually grew. So kind of funny there, this um, difference in terms of, you know, not being steady. And it's the same thing with that data centric group, except the opposite. You know, for the three months, you're looking at a $500 million increase. Whereas in the nine months, you're looking at like a $1.5 billion decrease. So these things are a little off from each other. And maybe that's just because, you know, consumers are buying or the enterprise uh, side is buying at different times as they see, you know, their money coming in or what's going on. So it's maybe these things are balancing and that could kind of be seen as a positive maybe that, you know, when one's down, the other one might catch up a little bit and, and smooth out the numbers, smooth out the revenue. But here, I think this is much more interesting. The Internet of Things right, even though this is a much, much smaller number, and presumably this is why they're reporting it, you can see almost a doubling from last year to this year for the quarter, right, 677 million to a billion, not quite a doubling, but it's pretty impressive. And nine months, you see a similar thing, not as much, but 2.2 billion to 2.9 billion. Clearly, that big jump, a good portion of it is in the past three months. So is this ramping up? And same thing with Mobileye, 234 million to 326 million. That's pretty big jump. Um, not as big, but pretty big. And in the nine months, 600 million to a billion, right? So obviously that more of that jump was in the previous quarters. That's the way I would look at it of the year. So is this slowing down? What's going on here? Now, in terms of their non-volatile memory solutions group, you can see the revenue has kind of been stagnant or going down. So I suppose they sold it. So I suppose that's always good. We'll talk about that on the next slide, though. And in terms of their FBGA, their programmable hardware, kind of stagnant. So nothing really changing. It's probably not the most common thing that's bought yeah, in terms of the numbers. It's almost one of their smallest part of their operating segments. So fair enough. Now, in terms of their operating income, so if you look at the client computing group, right, their operating income, 
similar story compared to their revenue, I suppose, going down a little bit in the three months, you know, up in the nine months. And same thing with the data centric group. You know, I think everything's kind of following the revenue, which makes a lot of sense. However, like I said, here's where things get interesting. The Internet of Things, you can see it's almost up four or five times because, you know, it went from 61 million to 276 million in terms of their income. And is that part of, you know, uh, that they've gotten more efficient? What's really going on here? Same thing with Mobileye, you're seeing a similar, a similar number. In the FPGA, you're seeing a huge difference, right? 29 million versus 442 million. That's a pretty substantial difference from one year to the next. Nevertheless, like I said, they sold this part of the company. Uh, in terms of the FPGA, um, I wouldn't say stagnant, right? It's almost doubling, but it's such a small number. It's not something I'm really concerned with. And I don't see it necessarily growing, right? Like the other ones, even though the other ones are also small numbers maybe, but I could really see them growing. So in, in terms of their revenue, you can see that the desktop platform went up this quarter compared to last year. Uh, the notebook went down and uh, I think they make mention of that somewhere. I don't know if I highlight it that, you know, these things kind of offset each other as people are buying, I suppose, more desktops and getting rid of or, or not getting rid of, but not buying more notebooks. Um, I suppose that makes sense as people were kind of stuck at home. Maybe I'm not sure. I was trying to think about that a little bit. Nevertheless, in terms of their contract liabilities, I didn't really totally understand what was going on here, but uh, I did try to research it and nothing really came up. If anyone knows, please leave a comment. And by the way, if you like this, please comment, subscribe, let me know what you think. And uh, if you want to know anything else about Intel, as I've had to read through their whole quarterly report. Nevertheless, they had our, their largest prepaid customer with a balance of $1.6 billion. So they returned almost a billion dollars. They got to keep $600 million dollars. Um, because of whatever completed performance. So you can see how sometimes they have these contract liabilities, people owe them money, doesn't always come to fruition. This is a pretty big one. Maybe this is also part of the hit to the stock um, as people are maybe pulling out or as partnerships are breaking. You know, is that what someone saw? I don't think so personally. I don't think this is such a big deal. I'm sure this happens maybe not on a regular basis, but um, I don't know. To me, it's not overly concerning. You know, they still in theory made money. Okay, in terms of their other financial statements, they mentioned their inventories, right? And so like we said before, they seem to be ramping up and that seems to be true, right? It's go growing in raw materials and work in progress and finished goods. So the total inventories are going up, but the accounts receivable, more people are buying them. So that if, if that continues, it makes sense why they're ramping up all of these things. And especially with computer chip shortages, it makes a lot of sense. Now, in terms of litigation charges, you can see there's a, a massive one. Uh, when you're looking at the nine month period. So not necessarily from this quarter, but it's 2.2 billion. So it's worth mentioning. And that has to do with VLCI litigation. My assumption is that has to do with the FPGA. So those programmable chips, which are a pretty small segment, but nevertheless, a massive uh, lawsuit. And the truth is, I did see someone mentioning that in theory, if Intel loses in other places, uh, this lawsuit could, you know, get a lot more... Uh, mm, costly, let's call it. However, Intel has tons of lawsuits. They almost have more lawsuits than chips. It was a little dizzying reading through them all. I, I'll be honest, I did not follow them all. I did not pay attention to them all. It's definitely something to consider. But clearly, Intel has a legal firm, although they lost this one. So I'm not saying they're the best. Um, Intel could be totally wrong in this. Um, so we'll have to see what happens. But clearly, if they are going to pay in these other states, it's not going to be, as far as I can tell, going to happen so quickly. I'm sure there's tactics to delay things and, you know, a world of lawyers. So something to consider, though. Um, obviously, that's not what caused the fall because in this quarter, right, that was, I mean, I can't say it's for sure. But in this quarter, there were no litigation fees or consider considering 2.2 billion, it's pretty much like they had no litigation fees. Um, so obviously, that's not like new news. And yet the stock fell. So I'm kind of discounting that. But I think it's something you should keep in mind as you're looking at the stock. So they mentioned that they acquired move it for almost a billion dollars, um, Israeli company, same with Mobileye, also an Israeli company. And pretty much it's their mapping. It's a mapping company. It's similar, I suppose, to Waze. And they have all of these maps. I'm not entirely sure, but we'll talk about it a little bit more. Clearly, they're trying to connect the mapping with Mobileye. So they're they're allowing themselves to move into this uh, ability to uh, drive a car on itself by itself, where they have, you know, visual uh, camera and LIDAR, all these different things interplaying also with a map now that they control the data, right, which makes a lot of sense. And so they, they're getting a holistic picture and they're building out this technology, which I think is pretty exciting. 
in terms of their divestitures, we mentioned their NAND memory business that they're getting rid of, and they'll be getting $7 billion upon initial closing. You know, so that's going to happen prior to November 1st, 2021. So presumably that's happened. And they will get the other $2 billion um, at the end or March 2025. Now, the manufacturing of the FAV assets will happen in Dali in China in, until that second closing. So until 2025. Now, presumably, uh, maybe Intel's not getting you know, the same amount of money they would get from someone else for these fab assets, you know, for the fabrication, uh, just because it's probably they got a good deal, the person they're selling to as they sold the business, that would just be my guess, I have no idea. And so I don't know if it's at cost, I don't know if what's going on here. But uh, in theory, there's the chance that at least Intel has clients, you know, this NAND memory business, uh, which I suppose is good, right? It's always good to have clients. And of course, they sold the company. Now, in terms of their long-term debt, so in 2021, very little, you know, two, we're talking about $2 billion. And in 2022, also very little, you know, a few billion dollars that they, in theory, have to push forward or just pay off. Uh, of course, they have debt, in, <laughs> amazingly, to 2051, 2061. So they've got debt for quite some time. And as we mentioned, $35 billion in total long-term debt. But of course, they seem to be able to pay that off when they want to, as long as they don't spend too much money on the research and development. But uh, I think everything looks pretty impressively you know, good, but what do I know? Okay, in terms of their foreign currency contracts and interest rate contracts, there's a substantial amount, right? You're talking about almost $50 billion. Obviously, as they get more cash, they have to make sure that as currencies uh, fluctuate, that their money in those areas doesn't uh, fluctuate too, um, you know, too much. And they are always kind of keeping that same value of cash, right? So they have to, as, as they hold more cash, I suppose it gets riskier in terms of what's happening with all these other foreign currencies, what's happening and how do they make sure that they're not losing value from, you know, inflation and all these other things. That's just the way I looked at it anyway. Client computing group. Okay, so now they're breaking it down a little bit more. And you know, here's where they mentioned the notebook volume declined. And they claim that this is because of industry wide component shortages that that affected their notebooks. However, on the other hand, it didn't really affect their CPUs for the desktop. So I'm not sure exactly if I believe that or not, but that's what they say. Uh, nevertheless, their desktop demand strengthened. And so that kind of helped offset. Now, what I found really interesting in terms of their operating income summary, they mention, you know, as they ramp up Intel 4, right, there's higher charges, um, higher charges as they ramp down their 14 nanometer process and um, lower platform unit cost now because of their 10 nanometer super fin process. So all these things as they're moving technologies, there's going to be a change in costs. And so that's pretty interesting. And when we look at the data center group, right, they mentioned they have a big recovery now because of enterprise and government market segment, which hopefully will continue, of course. But um, you see all of these things are negatives, the same Intel 4, 10 nanometer super fin, the 14 nanometers being ramped down. So as they transition these technologies, hopefully they'll get more efficient. Hopefully they'll increase their operating margin, right? They'll make more profit from the same amount of revenue. And that's kind of what I'm looking at because they're not going to change these processes every single year. At least I don't think so. I would be pretty impressed. Um, so this is to me a positive moving forward that they're just going to increase their operating margin and some of these costs hopefully will kind of run, uh, run out their course, uh, run their course, sorry. So just something I had noticed, I suppose, maybe it's not a big deal, not a lot of money, but two operating segments, you know, I suppose it adds up to, you know, five, $600 million maybe. So like I said, maybe not the biggest deal, but eh, not nothing. Okay, in terms of their Internet of Things, here they mentioned that it was up $92 million, their mobile eye, and then has to do with car production. So that also makes a lot of sense, right? That car production is going to affect their mobile eye self-driving features. So Intel or that segment is going to be tied to the car consumer segment. So kind of interesting. Now, this is my guess of why the stock fell so much. They pretty much said that their gross margin is uh, going to be approximately 51 to 53% for the next two or three years moving up forward. And so they're probably kind of pegging it because, you know, up until now, it's been 53, 56%, whatever it is. They're clearly bringing it down. And why are they bringing it down? Because they want to focus on research and development. I think that's a really positive thing. But it could very well be that a lot of investors are upset with this. Now, like I just said, their gross margin might still improve a little bit more just because of other processes. I don't know if they're taking that into account or not, 
but they're clearly setting, um, I guess not, uh, I guess expectations to do worse. Now, in terms of the research and development, I thought it was pretty interesting, you know, $530 million increase, 16.2%. So you're already seeing that, that push and it's incentive cash compensation. That's number one. Now, obviously the new CEO, he was an engineer. And so maybe he's on, he understands the kind of, um, I don't know, just the environment and Intel, and maybe he feels like he has to get people excited a lot more. You know, Intel is the underdog. AMD was really crushing Intel. And now Intel looks like they're coming back strong with a lot, a lot of technology. It's really exciting. We'll talk about it a little bit more. But maybe this is his way of motivating. Hopefully they're not perverse incentives where people kind of, uh, let's say, come up with technology that's maybe bad, but they want to get part of that incentive program for coming up with a new idea and it's distracting. You know, hopefully sometimes incentive packages can actually have detrimental effects. But I kind of get the idea of where he's going. Now here in terms of the year to date, uh -huh, incentive based co cash compensation is lowest on the list. So this is something new that they just added and they're putting a lot more money in this third quarter. Is that why it's first or is the order makes no difference? I have no idea. What you could see though, in terms of the spending increase, you can see year to date is 12.5. When you look at the last quarter, 16.2% increase. So is that kind of maybe a ramping up? Now, um, in terms of gains and losses on equity investment, they mentioned they have a $500 million observable price adjustment that they recognize in Beijing Unisoc technology. And uh, pretty much this is some company um, in China that has to, that, that, that it sounds just, you know, you can read the Wikipedia article, assuming this is the right one, I assume it is, um, that pretty much they develop chips for, I guess, telecoms. And uh, they mentioned working with 5G and Intel um, so pretty interesting, you know, the different places where Intel has, I guess, investments, same thing with McAfee. They got a special dividend of $1.1 billion. They bought McAfee a long time ago, pretty much. They wanted to develop their securities, um, segment or security area of their chips. They wanted McAfee to work, I guess, more closely with the Intel chips that do their own security. However, management realized that this kind of, uh, I guess synergy, I'm not sure what the right word is, it wasn't planning out, it wasn't panning out. So they just separated McAfee into its own business. Of course, they still owned shares, but they wanted it to be run on it separately and focus on the software, I guess, ignore the hardware. Intel's still working on the security side from their hardware, but they kind of recognize that they're different. And uh, nevertheless, <laughs> Intel still made gains of 1.1 billion from a special dividend. <coughs> Okay, so now some of the business highlights. This is pretty exciting. And if this doesn't excite you, well, maybe you're more exciting than me and this is boring. But to me, this is pretty exciting. Okay, so they have a contract or part of a program with the US government. I understood that this has to do with Foundry. So really building chips in the USA. And obviously, I don't think Intel has a monopoly on that. But it's there's very little uh, Foundry manufacturing of the chips in the USA. And so this is pretty exciting, especially if there's some issue, um, you know, in, in the Far East, let's hope nothing happens. But uh, if, let's say, supply chains are cut off, this will put Intel in an amazing, amazing space to get tons of clients. And we're going to talk about some of the synergies as well. Um, and I think they're also developing in Europe as well. Um, I'm not entirely sure. You can look up all their foundry services, but you can see they already have a first customer, Amazon. They're working with Qualcomm, hopefully. They feel like they're ahead of schedule, which is pretty exciting, right? How many times you get to hear about that? Alder Lake, this is their new CPU, and we're going to have to talk about this, but pretty much it is revolutional. Um, so it is, how, how do I explain this? But they have efficient cores on the CPU, and then they have, um, you know, more powerful cores. And so the powerful cores will focus on things like gaming or what, what you know, these tasks and obviously they have some scheduler that helps uh, focus on getting the right cores, the right CPU instructions, and the efficient CPUs, which are much smaller, uh, will handle, let's say, background tasks. And the scheduler, the system that sends these instructions to the different CPUs, I think that's the key uh, to all of this, in my humble opinion, to make sure it works well. And they're working with Windows 11. That's what I think is the most exciting. And so Windows 11 will be will work extremely well with Intel. AMD is already running into problems with Windows 11. And so even though AMD might have a great 
CPU, and we'll talk about the comparison in just a second, uh, it's the very fact that the software is tailor-made in a way to Intel, you know, that puts Intel at a serious, serious advantage. So that is pretty exciting. Um, and even if Windows solves the AMD issue, you know, when you're thinking about now buying a CPU, do you want to buy the CPU that had issues for a while or the one that was kind of working with Windows 11? So kind of interesting. But also I think the technology in Intel is ahead of AMD, at least for now. Uh, they also have the Intel Arc, right? They're pushing their high performance graphics products, right? We all know how how forward N NVIDIA is. Is this the direction that Intel is now going as well? They want to take on NVIDIA. They want to take on graphics, right? They've had a lot of graphics um, as part of the CPU. It's built in and it's very lackluster. It's not amazing. Well, now are they kind of redirecting into a whole new operating segment? That's pretty exciting. I didn't really see so much of anyone talking about that, but when I see that kind of uh, high performance graphics products, that's what hit my head. And uh, I think the new CEO is really looking at pushing Intel much further. Um, you know, here they mention uh, being connected with Surface Designs with Microsoft. Like I said, that interop that 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 connection and that interoperation of you know the hardware and the software and really being connected that's going to be a huge win. Now here, in terms of their mobile eye, I thought that this was pretty exciting. They have a partnership with Zeker and 6SE which I think is a rental car company. Um, why is that a big deal? So Geely, which owns uh, Zeker, which is building this car with Mobileye, while they also own Volvo cars, right? They own tons of other car manufacturers. And so this could really spread, if it works well, of course, in Zeker, it could really spell to a, a, a spread to a lot of other, of the other car manufacturers as they borrow, even if Geely sells off Volvo. But it, it just exposes them to all these other car companies. They also mentioned the Robo Taxi, which is pretty impressive. And you can look up Mobileye. And there's a lot of people who are really pro Tesla, who are really anti Mobileye, and vice versa. So it's hard to get a really true understanding of what's going on. To me, it's pretty exciting. Um, and especially because Intel, I don't actually respect this so much at Intel. I think the new CEO, we'll see if he changes this approach. But pretty much what's happening is if you have Mobileye in your car, you cannot develop another system. And the system that Mobileye uses is cameras, is LiDAR. They work separately. Um, so they claim that's redundancy. I think actually the bigger benefit is two. One is if the government says, well, we want your self-driving cars to also use LiDAR because they, they're nervous, well, Mobileye is in a perfect position to use both. But more importantly, um, I, I think that it's just the fact that they can work in a separate mode, meaning... Um, the cameras will pick up one thing, the LiDAR will pick up something else, but they could just use cameras. They could, I don't know if they can just use LiDAR, I'm not entirely sure if it works that well, but it's another piece of data that they can use, which is pretty impressive. And of course, it's the car companies that are going to be paying for the LiDAR. And so maybe that'll hurt some of the other car companies, but it's really, uh, um, it's really, really beneficial to uh, Intel to be able to do all of this and to take advantage of all that extra data, right? I think that's a very important point. And just like we mentioned before, they're buying this mapping system of all the roads. And so they understand, you know, road paths of all the people who are driving. And so they're collecting just tons and tons of data of people who drive, seeing how they drive, what are they, what are their interactions. And I saw some uh, somewhat recent uh, unveiling, I don't know exactly, you can look at it on YouTube, but I think it was in Israel where they were showing pretty much all these different situations that the car was able to drive itself. Now, does that mean it's going to be coming out exactly now? No, there's going to be a lag in terms of car companies getting it into them and, and approving it. So there's always going to be this lag that I think Tesla has Mobileye beat on in a sense because they can just push all of this technology really quickly into their cars. So on that sense, I think Tesla has an advantage. But Mobileye is really pushing forward, right? Not everyone has a Tesla. And if if Mobileye can really get into all these car makers um, before Teslas can become cost, you know, uh, you know, affordable to the average person, people people will be used to Mobileye, right? They'll they'll just understand that this is a feature in so many cars. So it's pretty exciting. We'll see where that really goes and if they have robo taxis really working um, soon, uh, even if they're in beta and even if there's people who have to sit there to make sure everything works. Um, they also mentioned their second generation neuromorphic chip. So this is 
you know, if you're a geek, this is pretty exciting. Neural network chips that are in the hardware. So they're not in software, which is pretty impressive. Uh, this is probably one of their smallest segments. I have no idea. I'm sure there's so few people who use this. But nevertheless, if this can be developed, if there can be a standard of TensorFlow, if all these other um, areas of artificial and uh, neural networks kind of build on, and they can make a standardized set of, I don't know, instructions or, int uh, you know, integrations with the software, this would be huge in my opinion. So kind of exciting. Okay, so what's the summary? So first of all, they have a new CEO, engineer, really amazing, really taking the company in a new approach. And he seems to be excited, which I'm sure rubs off. They have Foundry, which of course, you know, there's chip shortages right now. Who knows what's going to happen with the political and the dynamics with the Far East. So really exciting. They're focusing on AI, like I said, with these chips. That's a huge, even though it's tiny, it's probably minuscule part of their segment, but this could explode, right? If you think about all the different applications for AI, where people could, you know, offset, you know, building expensive hardware to run AI and just put it into a really simplistic chip that's already been trained. That's kind of interesting, intriguing. I don't know if it'll work out, but uh, it's pretty exciting. Mobileye. In my, in my opinion, I mean, you have to look at the videos yourself and how much do you trust them? Are they, let's say, massaging what they show um, other people? And are they setting the bar too high? I don't know, but it's really exciting from my perspective. They're obviously working on brand new chips, brand new systems, right? The Alder Lake, uh, big little CPU design, right? Like we just said, that there's a fishing cores, right? They're obviously pushing forward with this really new, um, really new technology. And as you can see here, in the subtext, you can see that um, it crushes AMD's Ryzen, even when it's multi-threaded. So that's pretty exciting. I saw another article talking about Zen 4D, which is you know AMD's next uh, successor to Intel Alder Lake. And I think um, there there was in the article, I'm not sure if it was 4D or 5D, but they were pretty much mentioning that they were doing exactly what Intel is doing, except they're going to be a few years before they actually get to, that to the public. So, you know, they're they're following on the heels of Intel, which is crazy when you think that AMD was really getting a lot of the brand recognition for being the best CPU and now Intel's coming out and swinging and they're 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 ahead of AMD, that's what it looks like. So that's really exciting. Now, open sourcing. Now, this is part of the CEO's new approach and this is fascinating. I think it's a pretty positive um, so pretty much what they're going to do is the Intel x86 architecture. They're going to share that with other people if and only if they're going to build their chips as part of the foundry of uh, Intel. So Intel will make money, I suppose, working and licensing the architecture. Um, I don't, I, I, maybe they don't charge the licensing fees at all, but certainly they'll get some exposure to what other companies are doing with their architecture. I'm sure these other companies will want to work with Intel. So even if there's no licensing fees, I'm sure there's going to be some, you know, a dynamic where Intel will get some money to help design and help run things. But of course, they're going to get lots of money from actually building the chip shortages. Uh, sorry, yeah, for actually building the chips, especially with chip shortages, they could bring a lot of people over to Foundry. And when you think about the fact that when someone now is partnering with you with the design of their chip, it's not going to be so easy for them to go to a different Foundry because that that chip design, because it has part of Intel's architecture, which is pretty exciting for someone to join with Intel to get that boost of technology, well, they can only use that, legally speaking, when they actually build it or uh, develop it in the foundry, they actually make it in the foundry. So it's almost like uh, sucking someone into your kind of sphere and saying, yeah, let's work together, but you got to do me uh, this favor and always use my business to build your chip. So that's kind of exciting from my perspective. Um, and then next that, you know, just a new approach to business from the CEO, just like I said, with this open sourcing approach to their architecture, which has always been closely held by Intel, you know, it's pretty impressive how AMD got it in the first place. Um, and you know, everything's just so exciting. They're just doing so much. They're building so much, right? The internet of things, they have this segment in, in cars. I'm sure they're looking at internet of things in so many other places and so many other segments where you can have these chips play an important role. But not just an important role, but Intel is going to develop them and, and work on them with the software, with everything. So there's a platform. So you're not just buying Intel's chip, you're buying almost like a platform, right? It's almost, if you think about it, the way Apple works with their 
laptop, it's not just you're buying the laptop, you're buying the operating system as well. And so there's like an ecosystem. So Intel, if they're working on this internet of things, hopefully they'll take what they've done with Mobileye and expand this to other th areas where, you know, you're not just buying the chip. Like I said, you're buying a platform. And uh, so hopefully that's, you know, I'm pretty excited about the general direction. Now, what are the cons? You know, there's obviously some major cons. Gross profit, like we mentioned, is going down. They're doing major investments that might not pay off, especially as, you know, things become more difficult. But I think, I personally think those major investments are positive. Mobileye might be a failure, right? They might just be presenting this facade of something really impressive. But at the end of the day, if it gets into too many car accidents, it could be even better than Tesla. Uh, you know, these things just kind of take a life of their own in terms of sentiment, right? You're dealing with consumer sentiment. So that could be a real serious risk. Of course, this is a very small portion of Intel. That's the luck, right? The luck is that this is almost nothing. It could be something amazing, but you can't just buy it on only that hope. Um, open sourcing, this could be a serious risk just as people get the architecture and especially since there's Chinese companies that have their own x86 car architecture because they do some deals with AMD are, you know, is some of this information going to leak and so get into their competitors' hands? I don't know. It's a little bit of a risk because they're going to open source even the most developed system. How are they going to control that? Maybe they will have some control. New approach to business. <laughs> it's uh, The CEO claims that the board is totally on board, but if they decide you know, this is not working, they could pull the rug out of everything. And uh, so all this investment, all of this direction, you know, it could just spin, because this is a totally new approach for Intel. And so hopefully Intel really is okay with it. And hopefully their clients and business and everyone is okay with it. Um, I personally think it's pretty exciting. But you know, that doesn't always pan out. And if someone disagrees, this could go really badly. Um, and it's exciting. Why is that a con? Well, <laughs> there's a lot of excitement. And so you could misread things, you could get yourself biased, you know, the stock could shoot up based off of excitement. And then when things don't deliver, you know, uh, you know, things fall, right? That's what happens with growth companies. In terms of the actual stock value, you can see it's kind of channeled around here for quite some time, I suppose, kind of bouncing. And you can draw this top line further up if you'd like, you know, this is not exactly a science, it's just an art. Um, so it's kind of in the middle right now. Um, obviously, where it was before at like 48, that's a much better price, obviously. Uh, but it's very possible that it could come down pretty close to $40. So how do you really deal in terms of buying this? Well, this is adv this is not advice, not financial advice. You have to work this out on your own. I don't know what the technicals exactly are here. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it comes down to 40, right? It's touched this line so, so many times before. On the other hand, this is pretty exciting news for the company. So if I was going to invest in this, my position personally would be, well, I want to see what happens. I want to see if this thing comes down a little bit more and then I'll invest more, right? I have lots of options. Uh, this is a pretty exciting one, but I don't mind missing it for a little bit. If, however, I said, I really want a blue chip company that I feel comfortable, I feel more secure, and this is one that's even going to grow. Well, maybe then I would start putting in a little bit of money, hoping that it goes down and I can put in more and more money. Um, that would be definitely one approach. Um, and the reason why I guess I'm not as gung ho about this is because like I said, it's in the middle. It's, it's not so crazy to me to see this fall a little bit. That being said, if I really liked Intel, and I kind of do, there would be a part of me that would be hesitant to wait because there's so much positive news here, in my opinion, that uh, and it's so exciting, the whole company and especially chip shortages, just everything about this, um, I would be a little bit hesitant to wait too long and expect prices to, you know, drop too much and be too greedy. So it really depends on, do you, you know, your proclivity in terms of, you know, do you have other stocks that you're looking at that you prefer? Do you really love Intel? You're falling in love with this kind of uh, business story because that is another part of it as we're looking at the financials. Uh, the technical part, though, that's a little bit out of my uh, ballpark. You can see that there is a lot of support and resistance at this line. So, you know, if it comes back down below fifty dollars as it dances around this line, it might really reach the $40 mark. And so I would wait. But if it if it stays at this $50, that's going to be support uh, and give it a lot more support moving forward. So it's a really hard call for me. Um, but like I said, this is really going to depend on what ideas, what other investment ideas, what do you feel comfortable with? Do you like the fact that it's a blue chip company, right? There is definitely a lot of positives to this company. And you could just wait a few days and see what happens. I don't know if anything, even though there are pr some pretty dramatic swings, well, you know, it's uh, something that you could approach. But uh, like I said, in my opinion, this is a great company to invest in, a great story, lots of growth, 
I'm so excited about Intel. In terms of the price, I don't know, that's a little bit more up to you. You can look at other videos. I don't think that's our, you know, the specialty. We really want to look at the financials and deep dives, at least on that. If you want me to pay attention more to the price, I could do something on that. If you have any other questions about Intel, any other companies, any advice, please like, comment, subscribe, let me know. And uh, thanks so much for watching.